Tero and Saranai. So what I've been contemplating recently is the uh, five frequent uh, contemplations, so the five subjects to be uh, frequently contemplated. So as you know, these are the contemplations about I'm subject to old age, I'm not exempt from old age, that's the first one. The second one is I'm subject to illness, I'm not exempt from illness. And then the third one is, I am subject to death, I am not exempt from death. The fourth one is, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. And the fifth one is, I am the owner of my kamma, the heir of my kamma. I have kamma as my origin, kamma as my relative, kamma as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever kamma. So... Buddha says in this sutta, in his teaching, that this is something if we frequently recollect, if we develop it, if we uh, frequently practice it, it generates the path. And I was contemplating this in the sense of we always think that we're on the path and, and therefore there's no need to generate it. But what I realized from contemplating this uh, a little more is that every time we contemplate these five things, we actively generate the path because often we get busy and we slide into wrong view but when we make a habit of actually doing this meditation actually contemplating these five meditations there's something about buddha dhamma that activates at that point and it's good to not assume that our noble eightfold path is always active and so when you think about it from that perspective it's a really good thing to actually um, ensure that, that we practice these five contemplations. Now, the other thing that uh, arises from it is really about Dukkha, the first noble truth of Dukkha, that when you look at the four noble truths, the Aryatanka Manka, that the first noble truth is, is Dukkha, that uh, Buddha says it must be understood, that um, there is the origin of of dukkha which is tanha the craving and buddha says this is something that we must abandon and then the third one is uh, the cessation of dukkha so it's the niroda that we have to realize it and the last one of course is the noble eightfold path so the way leading to the cessation of dukkha and this must be what we develop now when you look at the five frequent contemplations this is really all about dukkha that we, by doing this meditation, we're acknowledging that there is dukkha in old age, there is dukkha in illness, there is dukkha in death, and there is dukkha when we are parted from what we hold dear, what is beloved, what is pleasing to us, and, and karma, that if you reflect that this birth, this current birth, the creation of this body, it is out of our past karma that, that we have created this particular body. And whatever we do now and collectively with our past karma will generate um, a future birth unless we uh, cultivate the path and, and see through um, the ignorance and the, and the craving, the avijja and the tanha. So the five... Um, contemplations are very important to the first noble truth that when you think about the three stages like under each stage under each noble truth there's three stages so that the first stage is always that you understand that there is a truth there so there is dukkha there is tanha there is niroda and there is uh, the noble eightfold path and the second stage is what which we're all trying to do right now which is what do we need to do the knowledge of what needs to be done and so with dukkha, it's like we're trying to fully understand dukkha, all its different shades, all its different guises. And in terms of uh, tanha, we're trying to understand, you know, what is it that we're trying to abandon? And for the niroda part, we're trying to understand or to realize how to actually do that. And then the way is, of course, the path that we develop. Now, the third stage under each of these four noble truths is where the arahant the ones that have perfectly realized where they have got to, which is Dukkha has been fully understood, Tanha has been fully abandoned, Niroda 
has been fully realized, cessation, and then the Eightfold Path has been developed. And so where we all are at the moment is the second stage, most of us, because we understand you know, the first stage of Buddha's teaching that it's because we're here that we make effort. And, and so this second stage is really what needs to be done. And so what I understand from cultivating more of the five subjects to be contemplated is that it really goes a long way towards penetrating dukkha that to really understand it, one needs to practice these five contemplations. When it comes to old age, it's something that we actually normally shy away from at any age. When we're young, we really, you know, it, it, we're not interested in it because we're still young. When we're middle aged, we're so busy and it, it hurts when we have to contact um, anything that is decaying, anything that is old. And the most obvious is, when we see our parents aging and uh, you know their sense faculties are starting to wane, it's very difficult to actually bear with it. We don't want our parents, for example, uh, to be that way. We want to fix it. We don't want to see it. And so that's the most obvious one. And even when we look at, say, uh, young children as they grow up, it, it still surprises us that they age. Uh, in many respects, our perceptions are still that they are young. And uh, what Buddha asks us to do when we look at old age is to contemplate where we still have wrong view around youth, this Yorbana mother. And it's a really difficult one because when you contemplate it, you realize that society is always telling you that youth is the best. Being young, showing that you still have strength, vitality, um, all the things that are associated with youth, it's something to be proud of, you know, and that's where this mother comes from this intoxication this pride and when you meditate you're really trying to crack open how we think like where are the ways that we fall down in our thinking because really from a dukkha perspective youth is starts off when we're young it starts off as if it's an agreeable object you know it's something that we find pleasing because we we still look nice we still have strength we can do lots of lots of things but as we get older, it becomes a disagreeable object, an amana paramana, because at that point when we look in the mirror, it's not so it's not so nice to look into the mirror because you see wrinkles and blemishes and things like that. And then when you go to do things, you notice your balance is not so good. You don't have as much strength as you used to. You can't see as well as you used to. The taste buds start to, to decline. And so you can see from a dukkha perspective, when you're young, you go from, you know, manapa ramana, it becomes amanapa ramana. And it, you get quite sad and sorrowful, especially if you don't uh, contemplate correctly. And so the way I see Buddha's teaching about um, jarapi dukkha is that when we contemplate on this, it's really starting to see that we need to not take refuge in youth, not to take refuge in any way in these bodies because when we see collectively that we are all subject to old age, then we know that we, we don't actually have an intention towards creating another birth, particularly in a body. And because these bodies are, are so fragile and, and subject to, to old age, um, and that's something that needs to be penetrated. Now, the thinking that we need to overcome so when you meditate on it you're always thinking oh how, how am i thinking that's not quite right so it's thinking like oh you know when you say oh that person looks good for their age or uh, you think oh because i exercise every day i'm still young or you think uh, maybe if i use this cream it will be good on my face or uh, you know with your friends you, you say oh we're still young there's still plenty of time and one of the things is that like at any age whether you're 10, whether you're 20, whether you're 30, whether you're 50, whether you're 70, if you think or you see that there's someone older, you'll always think that you're youthful. And so these thoughts come in uh, at that point in time when you make contact with someone that is older, that you, you think about that person, you think, well, I'm still young. And when we meditate, it's important to correct the view, to not go with that, because otherwise we're reinforcing wrong view. And I think with this meditation, Buddha's always trying to get us to correct our view and to not 
even in the slightest way, think it's good to be born, you know, good to be born into another body um, like that. And so then the second contemplation is around illness. And I think this is one of the things that right now it's at the forefront of our minds because of the pandemic and because everyone's just, you know, talking about illness. And when it comes to illness, what we normally grasp onto instead of illness is good health. And so this Arogya Mother about, you know, being proud of not getting sick, being proud of um, having good health is something that we get intoxicated with. And again, it goes from an agreeable object to a disagreeable object when you have health and then it slides into bad health or not so good health. And, you know, you experience dukkha when it changes like that. And again, the conventional norm is people don't like to admit when they're sick. So say, for example, terminal illness, it's almost like a taboo to talk about illness in, in the sense of, you don't want to be um, shunned or, or blamed. Like even with COVID right now, to actually say you have COVID is something that almost seems like shameful. But it is the nature of our bodies to get sick. And uh, we cannot take refuge in these bodies that are subject to illness. And if we hold on to health as something that we can control or that there's refuge in good health, we need to know that it doesn't last and not to have this idea that if we seek rebirth um, out of ignorance that we can grasp onto good health. And Buddha does say that the greatest in terms of health is really Nibbana. It doesn't slide. It's not something that like this body, it becomes sick. And, and so um, many of the times when you look at these contemplations, we get negligent when we get intoxicated with the wrong view. So when we're intoxicated with youth, when we're intoxicated with um, health or even life, Jivita Mother, when we talk about death, what happens is we start to get negligent, lose our vigilance towards certain things and then our virtues start to slide because we think it'll be okay. And that's the reason why this meditation is also quite important because it reins us back from thinking it will be okay when it really isn't. Like the minute you slide into wrong view, Micha Diti, it's good to make sure that you um, pull yourself back, make that effort. And if we frequently meditate in this way, then it's most helpful. Now, uh, as we as we know, when, when uh, sickness comes, the conventional norm is to say, well, you know, I'll bounce back. Or if I take this medicine, then I'll be fine. If I go on this diet, then you know I'll stay healthy. If I exercise in this way, I won't get sick. Uh, if I take the vaccine, then I'll be protected from COVID-19 and whatever else comes. But the thing is, we can believe that to a certain extent, but only up to a point, because we know that illness is always actually in the body. It's just that we don't notice it or we forget and distract ourselves and then don't realize that this body is always in sickness and if you think about what the Buddha says about the four illnesses that come uh, when we're born it's hunger thirst having to go number one having to go number two in terms of you know uh, urine and excrement so we are already subject to illness uh, according to the Buddha even without these other illnesses that are in the world and as we know Buddha has said as time goes on, there will be more and more illnesses. So it's good to actually correct the view. And then the third one is, you know, the contemplation of death, marana nusapi or uh, marana bidukkha. So, you know, with death, it's really the passing away of this body, the perishing, the disintegration, uh, losing our mortality, uh, the breaking up of this body, the breaking up of the aggregates, losing our life force. And we get very intoxicated with life, is what Buddha says. And how we know this is true is because we get caught up with our families, we get caught up with our jobs, we get caught up with our studies, we get caught up with seeking pleasure in the world. And that is the conventional norm. With most of these things, there's a lot of conventional or social things that make it seem all right. And so we think, okay, we're just following what everybody else is doing. And 
To a certain extent, that is true. But when we meditate, what we're seeking to do is to open up the real truth, not just the relative truth of what you know the society tells us, but to really penetrate Buddha's truth, because he's pointing to what is really true about Dukkha when we create this body. If we get distracted and intoxicated with life, then we lose sight of the fact that when we are born, we are subject to death. And so to penetrate the first noble truth, he's always asking us, don't take refuge in these bodies because they are subject to die. And if we seek rebirth thinking that we can continue to seek pleasure, then we will be subject to death yet again, you know, birth and death, birth and death. And not only that, like when we contemplate death, we always think, or we tend to think, that it is far away. Like when we watch anything on the TV, or listen to stories, or watch the news, sometimes the impression that is always being fed to us is that death is somewhere in the future. And it's not true. We, we each of us will know of people that have died, you know, young. And the story of the weaver girl that the Buddha talks about, which is a Dhammapada verse, um, and this young girl died at 19. And she didn't know that she was going to die, but the Buddha knew that and, and managed to give her a teaching. So she was a Sotapanna before she died. But for each of us, like when we meditate on this Maranampidukkha, it's also to crack open if we have this misapprehension. It's not going to happen to me now. It's going to happen to me in 20 years 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And if we have that view, it means sometimes and oftentimes we don't make effort towards the path. We actually delay. We go, well, this one's more important. Um, I've got to do this this thing. And so I, I'll spend some time on Dhamma, but maybe less. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Like if you consider yourself quite old and you're attending to Dhamma now, that's fine. But for everybody else that is younger, it's not to lose sight of the fact that it could be the next breath. It could be the next day. It could be the next week. It could be the next year. It could be, you know, 10, 20 years. But the thing is not to have this wrong kind of thinking that it is far away. So that's something that is useful to, to actually ensure that when you meditate on it, that you're not blocking that truth. And so the thinking is often like, oh, life is sweet, you know, everything's coming together, um, you know, I'm going for that promotion, or I need to get more money, or I'm living the dream, or I'm going towards the dream. Uh, this is sometimes, you know, what is infused in, even in young people. And for young people, it's also important to make sure that they have one part of themselves knowing that there is this truth about death. So they still fulfill, you know, we all still fulfill um you know what is expected of us in the world but at the same time we never lose sight of the end the end point and although we live and we fulfill our duties and we create a life it's really important that we don't lose sight of of the things that buddha tells us aging sickness death uh, and we don't leave things to the last minute we don't leave this true Dhamma and the practice and seeing through everything that is wrong view, we don't leave it to the last minute. So then the fourth one is contemplation of the fact that we'll be separated from, you know, what is dear and pleasing, that things which are Pia and Manapa, uh, that, uh, you know, we don't, we don't lose sight. We, we actually try and see that if we have attachments, if we have desire, that we're not grasping for these things because Buddha says in the Asu Sutta that you can't uh, actually fathom because it's greater than the four great oceans how many tears we have shed as we've gone through countless lifetimes. Um, you know, this sadness and this sorrow over being separated from what is pleasing and united with what is not, not pleasing. So Buddha's thing about our meditation, particularly about Manapa Ramana, the law of attract, that we go towards something that is pleasing, we see an agreeable object, we make contact that is pleasing, that is pleasant to us, and then we get we we expect sukhavedana, and of course you know you, you take something that you like, and of course you experience some form of sukha, 
but it turns, what does Buddha say, that it turns into vipranama dukkha, painfulness in change. And this is something that we need to frequently, frequently contemplate that as part of this particular part of the meditation. It's our loved ones. It's the things that we like. It's even during this time being locked down during COVID, if at any time we've been locked down, it's that feeling that you miss certain people, you miss being able to do things, you miss freedom, even freedom, that the concept of freedom is something that is dear to us. Or if you have a person that has passed away or a pet, you know, a beloved dog or cat, part of your family, even if they passed, you know, a long time ago, that feeling of sorrow when you make contact in your mind with them to think, I still miss them. This is what this dukkha is about. This is about the first noble truth that if we create another life, we are subject to all these things again because there is great sorrow, great pain, great grief over having to do this all again. And when we hold things very tightly, our material possessions, our jobs, our families, our friends, even such things as respect, power, fame, popularity, whatever it is, these are the things that we can't hold on to, that when death comes, you can't take any of these things with you. So Buddha is always saying that, be mindful of that, that there's a, a three Dhammapada verses, I think it's 209 to 211, where Buddha um, is advising these three ascetics not to practice that way, that not to be grasping for anything that is um, dear to you, or not dear to you, because both result in dukkha. And, and so that's the Buddha's um, encouragement. And then the last one is about kamma. And this was one that, at first it didn't really um, trigger as about dukkha as such. But then when you realize that we created this body out of past kamma, so what are our actions that we did before, and even before that, from previous uh, rebirths, that's what culminated in this particular life. That's what created this eye, this ear, this nose, this tongue, this whole body. And so whatever kamma we do now will have an impact, including our past kamma, on what happens in the future, so our future destination. And there's so many suttas that we can refer to that we know, like the Samsapaniya Sutta, the Chula Kamma Vibhanga Sutta, the Ducharita Vipaka Sutta, things that we already know about cause and effect, uh, the, the result of our actions, uh, whether they're good or bad actions. But the way to meditate on it is actually to see that um, if we can acknowledge that we experience dukkha in this lifetime, and none of us can say that we don't, then we know that karma has had uh, an impact on that because we took actions before which resulted in this birth, and from this birth, we are experiencing dukkha. So if we take refuge, or if we discard um, karma, if we don't take responsibility for our sila, if we don't walk the Noble Eightfold Path, if we don't um, uh, practice uh, dasa kusala, the skilled state, through body, speech, and mind, then the results for us won't be good. And uh, bad... Um, Bad actions lead to bad karma, lead to bad results, bad rebirth. And so all of us are not gearing towards that. But it's a very good thing, particularly when it comes to how we think around karma. So for some people, and it probably won't be us, but for some people, they think it doesn't matter what I do. You know, it has, there's no repercussions. And that's probably the worst part of how you can think when it comes to karma, because it's clearly wrong view. But for us, there are times when we think, oh, it will be okay, um, just this once. Or, you know, we let things slide a little bit for whatever reason. Usually there's some good reason that comes to our mind. But when you let things slide at any moment for any small thing, it's very important to remember that Buddha never uh, encourages that. The noble arahants never encourage that. Even in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, you know, Buddha is saying, not even the slightest fault, not even the slightest thing. And so when you think about it that way, and you know also that the Buddha has told us many times that even a human birth is quite difficult to obtain. 
it's like you know just a small grain of sand compared to the the vastness of the earth element or trying to um, get through a, a very very minute hole um, you know in this whole sea or mass of water it's like the Buddha's similes on this are, are quite um, deep and profound and, and quite shocking when you think about how difficult it can be and so when it comes to the contemplation of karma you know we need to to actually always contemplate correctly that we don't slide into ill will we don't slide into cruelty and a lot of the time what we find is when we don't get our virtue right we become negligent and out of negligence there is delusion and out of that we, we become quite cruel we say cruel things and we don't even know it and we do cruel things and we don't even know it and we can also have that cruelty within ourselves berating ourselves and defilements start to breed and and things of that nature and so when you think about these five contemplations um, we don't probably practice these enough because if we did then the path really starts to generate and the Buddha says that the fruit of this contemplation is that we start to uproot the fetters and we also start to abandon the underlying tendencies so these fetters are always associated these are the um, Samyojanas and the uh, underlying tendencies are the Anusayas so you have ten fetters and seven Anusayas so Buddha always says that like with the Samyojanas that's how uh, one measures how you enter the stream, whether you're a stream enterer, whether you're a, um, a once-returner, a non-returner, and then an arahant. And these are the, the most difficult things for us to actually uproot and to abandon because a lot, a lot of the time it's the ignorance that is actually um, quite deep within us. And when people practice all these other things, uh, it, it just strikes me that we, we miss something when we don't take to heart that these are the ones that Buddha says frequently re recollect them. If you think that Buddha says you can uproot the Samyojanas, you can abandon the Anusayas, that means you can actually complete the path with this. And so it's actually a very important meditation. And so I would encourage that if um, at any point uh, you include that in your meditation, toolkit that you bring it out and you you make effort towards these five contemplations uh, the results will be will be good this is what the buddha says